Hi everyone, Bernard here. I hope you're all staying safe and well and welcome to the Citizen Channel. We have a one of our City Pass special features today. We have a, a player in time, so we're going to look back at a player. Sometimes these guys might have only played a few games for City, they might have played hundreds of games for City, but uh, they're, all, they're all names that we know and we, we sort of, some of us have watched, some of us have seen, some of us just about heard of them, we don't know too much about them. But uh, So I do these little player in times and some uh, one of my viewers sort of commented on this young man and uh, I did have ideas of doing one on him, but obviously it's, it's sort of pushed it forward in my mind to do this quickly. So today we're going to have a player in time and it's... Um, yeah, I mean, there's no. You've seen the thumbnail, so there's no no uh, serious uh, hints as to who it is. We know it's going to be a Mr. Johnny Crossan, of course. Uh, various other names he was known by as well. We'll go into that. I mean, just it's 1965, 66 was my uh, first season of getting to Main Road on a regular basis, sitting in the plat lane with my dad and a flask. Uh, I'm pretty sure we used to take some sandwiches, or we used to call them butties in those days up north. Take, take me butty to watch the match. Uh, a chocolate biscuit, perhaps it's... Uh, I was just checking up, actually. I mean, I used to love wagon wheels, and I still do love wagon wheels even now. And, uh, yeah, I think they were around in the 60s, that's for sure. Or it could have been a, a Tunnock's Caramel Wafer. You know, other, other brands are available, obviously. But, uh, yeah, I still like those as well. So, as, as you can tell, probably. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I used to sit, and we used to have that, and we used to eat those at half-time. I have a flask of uh, tea or perhaps I had some OXO, hot OXO or something like that in it. I'm not too sure now, but obviously it's... Uh, sadly, obviously, my dad my dad passed when I was very young, only about 10 years old. So, uh, you know, I can't even share those memories with him now. But, uh, yeah, so that was a staple diet for all those English lads. Uh, wagon wheels or caramel wafers, etc. And it wasn't a bad start to my football in life, was it? 1965-66. OK, City were uh, playing the trade in the second division then but obviously it wouldn't be for long would it uh, and of course uh, in my bedroom at home I had World Cup Willie memorabilia taking pride of place uh, in the, during that uh, season obviously there's a big build up all, all the programmes all season were mentioned in the World Cup there's a big big uh, build up obviously to the 66 World Cup uh, and sat next to my picture uh, towards the end of 1966 I had a picture of Bobby Moore holding up the World Cup in my bedroom I remember that with World Cup Willie around him and sat next to that, I had a couple of pictures uh, of city orientated pictures. Uh, I think certainly one featured John Mercer, perhaps another one featured Malcolm Allison, only could have could have featured them both. But uh, yeah, I did have a sort of bare chested and a fully shirted picture, of course, of Mr. Johnny Crossan. So he was probably the first city player I ever had on my bedroom wall as, as a kid, uh, holding that second division trophy uh, in those images with Mercer, Allison, and obviously. Uh, that I'll show later on in this. Anyway, you'll get to see those images, and certainly, but uh, two of those three I've got there, uh, I would have had on my wall at home in in the bedroom. My big brother's United fan, so obviously he had United stuff on one side, and I had my City stuff on the other side. Yeah, there was no thoughts then, of course, when all this was uh, the glory of winning the second division title, the glory of winning the World Cup with England, that uh, a year later, Johnny Crossan would surprisingly be, over a year later, leaving us. So, obviously, it was uh, from, from being the captain and the skipper of our promotion-winning team, it, it was all, all to end, literally, 15, 16, 17 months later, unfortunately. So, today, we're on our Player in Time feature. We're going to have a look at... Uh, a City player who, uh, yeah, in a relatively short time, if you think about it, he wasn't there, I think he was there three seasons as such, uh, he was certainly could be called a cult City hero. Uh, please, so today we're going to have a look, player in time at Johnny Cross, and please, if you're new to the channel, push that subscribe button, push the bell notifications, so when you, if you like these vlogs, please tell your friends, City supporting friends, I do City stuff, uh, obviously City presents, City quizzes, City m magazine vlogs, loads of stuff on there, so please tell your friends about this, uh, these things I do, and of course, if you look at my playlist, I do film and TV stuff as well, I have a film and TV channel, so if that's of any interest, if it's not, don't worry, there's loads of football, but if the film and TV channel's any interest, please Go on there and check out my reviews on films and drama, information vlogs, etc. on there as well. Or, or if you know someone who might be interested. And please, uh, any link, that my links for Facebook and Twitter are there. So if you follow or friend me on there, I do check every couple of days and follow and friend everyone back. And all comments, please, on Johnny Cross and all your memories of Johnny Cross. And lovely, I'd love to, love to hear about them, what your memories are. As I said, he, he sort of left... Uh, 
City, um, yeah, I was to say, I was a little bit young to remember too much about him. All, all you know, the memories of pictures that I can see and knowing that I was there at certain games he played. But uh, let, let me know your memories anyway. And please, if you know time for a comment, give us a thumbs up. It's nice to get views, but it's lovely to get com uh, thumbs up as well. Yeah, so John Andrew Crossan, he was born on the 29th of November 1938 in Derry or London Derry, depending on what your political persuasion is. Northern Ireland, uh, yeah, it was nicknames. He was called Jobby, Jobby, uh, Jobby, Jobby Crossan in, in Ireland. Uh, of course, Johnny Crossan, we better knew him as in, in here in the in England, and he was just called Cross as well. Cross as a nickname, so he did have a two or three little nicknames. Uh, he played as an inside forward for Derry City uh, from 1954 to 1958. So I was born in 1959, so just before then. Uh, but his career was to take quite a mighty jolt even before he had ever really begun. I mean, I'll sort of summarise what happened, but obviously there's a lot more detail, certainly with the... If you go on to the Guardian newspaper and search for Johnny Cross and you'll find an interesting article there on the internet. And also there's a, there is a book, we'll talk about that later, uh, about John, John Cross or Johnny Cross. Uh, yeah, so his, his career took a little bit of a jolt before it even began. He was uh, nicknamed the Irish Irish Jimmy Greaves, so that was obviously he was well respected at the time. A great player for England, Jimmy Greaves, of course. Of people my age will know him. Uh, the England scouts were all, all, always over over in Ireland looking for players, etc. Uh, and uh, obviously. Derry knew they would probably lose their greatest asset there. I mean, there used to be a little little trick with these Irish amateur teams where they would actually start paying, sign a player on professional on the basis that he would then sign for another club. So just little tricks they used to do to bypass the system, which in those days and going back to 80, late 1800s and 1900s, all these little tricks had to be done because obviously uh, when amateurs were involved, it had, they had to be very, very careful. And obviously, when it when it was muted, that uh, uh, obviously he wants it, or an English club came sniffing around for uh, for uh, Johnny Crossan. Uh, he wanted fifty fifty of the money. He wanted half. Of, uh, sorry, Derry wanted half of it, but uh, obviously Johnny Crossan wanted uh, more or less eighty percent of it. So obviously they had a little bit of a fallout and. As it is, he fell out, and at the end of his contract for that season, as an amateur, he was quite free to go somewhere else, and he did. He actually, he actually moved, uh, uh, moved club. I think he moved to uh, Coleraine, which he was totally entitled to do. But uh, yeah, Derry, Derry had a little bit of a grudge. Uh, they had a little bit of grudge for this, and um, although obviously other clubs had done similar things, and obviously had either agreed with players or disagreed with players. Um, Derry was still smarting from this, so they reported both themselves and Crossan to the authorities. Obviously, they were willing to take a fine themselves, but they wanted to punish uh, uh, Johnny Crossan as well for this, for what he did. Um, and they sort of told him about, uh, they actually paid him a small weekly wage as well, which he wasn't supposed to do, again, under the amateur reel. So they gave all this information to the Irish FA and, and the governing bodies. And the bottom line, as I said, there's a lot more detail on this uh, around and about if you seek it out. But the bottom line is uh, he was given a lifetime ban, Johnny Crook, from football in the UK. Um, and he did appeal for it, but this sort of allowed him to try play his trade outside of the UK so he could go, go abroad, fortunately. But, uh, yeah, most neutrals were shocked by this, the ferocity of the ban. I mean, this... You know, there's a lot of political implications as well with him playing for Derry City and his uh, nationalism and all this sort of thing came into it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, as far as uh, John, Johnny Cross and Jobby Crossan was concerned, he just wanted to play football and uh, he was quite philosophical about it. So, that I say, that, banning, that ban didn't actually stop him going abroad. So, in 1959, obviously under a bit of a cloud, uh, he moved first to Sparta, Rotterdam, and then Standard Liège, where he actually was involved in a European semi-final against Real Madrid, no less. So, it, it's uh, sort of given, stood him in good stead, didn't it? But, uh, yeah, by 1962, though, still English clubs were interested in him. Obviously, Sunderland were the first to actually come and do something about it, and they had some, like, officials who were connected Connected and through their little official contracts, they helped they helped get this ban lifted. So obviously, he was able to come back to England and play English football. So uh, from from abroad, um, and he starred for Sunderland. But despite helping Sunderland get back in the first division and becoming a cult hero there as well with the Sunderland fans uh, in the sixty four sixty five season, he joined City. Yeah, I mean City probably at one of their lowest ebbs ever in history at that point. Uh, but we we had enough about us as a club to actually encourage this uh, Johnny Crossan to join us. 
uh, for just uh, just under forty thousand. I mean, some places say thirty eight thousand, some say thirty nine. But anyway, but just under forty thousand pound in January nineteen sixty five. As I say, which wasn't the greatest time for City. Uh, Derek Hodgson. Um, wrote a letter of welcome to Crossing in the Daily Express and this just showed how how highly regarded he was even now uh, from his from his stint at Sunderland he suggested John you have it in you to be the greatest player since Dennis Law commanding adulation almost an idolatry that you will never have known before half a great footballing city is seeking a hero and you can end the search there you go he said we were at our lowest step we were looking for heroes at that time to get us back up there and one or two did pop along didn't they and Johnny Crossan was probably a, probably one of them as well in a small way. He made his debut for City at number eight versus Derby County away in a 2-0 defeat on January the 30th and his first goal came on February the 20th in a 3-1 win against Southampton. I mean, he did have a great reputation on the pitch. He had a reputation for looking after his teammates, obviously, which obviously led to him getting the captaincy uh, and especially younger members of the team. Uh, there was an a couple of examples, but the main example of this was when 18-year-old Mike Doyle, yeah, remember Mike Doyle, made his full debut against Cardiff City in March 1965. He soon found himself being knocked around the pitch. This is a quote uh, by the older opponents trying to make their mark. At one point, Mike found himself tackled out of the pitch only to be picked up by, of course, Johnny Crossan, telling him to relax as he was going to take care of things. During the following play, Crossan played a ball past Mike's offender, the one who'd uh, been sort of aiming at Mike or having a go at Mike. Uh, but instead of running past him, he, he ran over him, firmly stamping his studs into the player's thigh and leg. There were different things in those days, weren't there? It wasn't... Uh, yeah, you got away with those things in those days. After that incident, apparently the Cardiff players left Mike alone, obviously being a little bit wary of Mr John, Johnny Crossan's uh, sort of looking after him. Uh, so he sort of got left alone then for the rest of the game. Apparently Mr Paul Hins has got a similar story to tell as well of how he protected him when he was a young lad playing for City uh, and he did, did sort of mention that in an article he wrote many years later. Uh, of course his passion was uh, whether protecting his teammates or for the game of football and when he was always there to see. I mean there's a an image up on the thing, screen there of a, a, a game against Leicester City in the FA Cup uh, where the ball trickled wide and the, the frustration and the sheer Passion just shows in his how he is with his with his arms up, etc. Um, he wanted that ball to go to go in, didn't he? I mean, this is just the passionate guy he was. And outside of City, of course, he was continued to be well respected. He came from Sunderland. He was doing wonderful things at City. And on the 29th of March, uh, 1966, uh, in the Everton programme, they sort of summed up uh, what most people outside of the club and obviously in football thought. Is when simply in their match programme notes, they described him as one of the cleverest inside forwards of modern times. I mean, high praise. This is the mid 60s. This is uh, World Cup win in England, you know, almost. You know, this is when. England had a great team. Uh, in 65-66, of course, Joe Mercer, who, who tried to sign Crossan uh, in a, a previous time, uh, and Alisson were put in charge. And, of course, they quickly made Crossan captain, acknowledging what skills he had in, in that role as well. And the final pieces began to be put together, of course, for a push for the title and the second division title to get back us get City back where they belong, basically. And uh, most of the country, if you read any of programmes at that time from other clubs, uh, most of the country believe City should be in the first division. They were a big club and they didn't understand why they were in the second division and City deserved to be in the first division. And that's not just City fans, that is football in general. Yeah, Crossan's importance was evident in a piece by Peter Gardner on the 30th of October 1965 in the, in the match programme against uh, Charlton. I'll just read from that, from the press box, Peter Gardner for the Manchester Evening News and Chronicle. Any side going for promotion must have considerable amounts of luck in its side as well as consistency and skill on the field. Luck with the run of the ball going your way and just as important, luck with injuries. So it was small wonder a shock crowd of Manchester City supporters watched skipper Johnny Crossan, a schemer of the side, being carried from the deep Dell pitch, yeah, it was a game against Preston, with what happened to appear to be a serious looking injury last Saturday. Whenever a stretcher is called for during the course of a match, the worst is always feared, with thoughts of a fracture quickly coming to mind. But as events turned out, look what a little word meaning so much was on City's side and the injury turned out to be nothing more serious than a bad bruise to a leg muscle. So there you go. I mean that again to lose Johnny Crossan at that stage would have been uh, would have been a 
a blow, a definite blow to Manchester City. And say it took a lot, took a lot for players to stay down and be stretched off in those days. But fortunately, uh, it wasn't too bad. But again, that just shows what high regard Crossan was uh, sort of held in uh, at Manchester City. Um, yeah, he would almost be a, an ever present. Uh, uh, that season, uh, the promotion winning season, he played. Although he started the season at number eight, uh, a certain gentleman called Colin Bell arrived as well that season, so he would finish at number ten. Uh, he had to relinqu relinquish the famous number eight shirt, but uh, Mr. Colin Bell took over the number number eight shirt, which is is fair enough. We can't argue with that, can we? Yeah, Crossan always led from the front. He was both talented and tough. And that was what what you wanted a player. I mean, even now, I mean, we 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 want that in a player, don't we? we want talent and toughness. We don't want them to roll around. Uh, there's a, some great images I promised earlier on. Some great images are there of crossing with the Division Two trophy, say with Allison and Mercer there. And a, a couple of those pictures I had there, the ones I actually had on my wall, alongside, of course, that Bobby Moore and Will Cup Willie. Yeah, the first season back, 66-67, back in the, uh, and this will turn out to be his last season at City, back in the first division, it was tough going for City on a whole, and especially for John, Johnny Crossan, uh, who struggled especially early on, and the fans were getting on his back, um, but behind the scenes, uh, Crossan had actually been involved in a car crash uh, before the season started, he was carrying a few injuries, especially to his knee, so he was sort of playing on, and he didn't, he wasn't sort of letting on to the sort of trouble it was causing him, in those those days, basically, if your player said he was okay, that was it. There was no great uh, any physical sort of, um, you know, the medical team, etc. If, if he said he was up to it, he did. But uh, it made him, he suffered. He just couldn't quite uh, get up to scratch. And the City city fans became a little bit the boo boys to him. A bit like that sometimes. Very sad, but that's how it is. It's not really changed that much either. So he tried to cover up the injury and play on. And he also suffered from a grumbling appendix as well. He was always su suffering from a bit of an illness as well. Um, and he was asked about the fans' discontent, the fans who were getting on his back uh, during the season. He simply said, I heard the jeers, but that's football. You are a king one day, a peasant the next. So, again, the philosophical side of Mr uh, Crossan coming out there. Uh, despite the problems that season, he only missed a handful of games. Uh, he was always there to step step up to take the penalties there's been an image on the screen there of him taking a penalty um we could do with him now perhaps but uh all was not well and um it didn't it was all sort of argued that he didn't quite fit in with the new plan alice allison and mercer's new fast uh speedy uh style that they wanted city to play he wasn't really up to that and uh Although he did feature in City's 67-68 pre-season tour, he would actually leave for Middlesbrough and finish his English league career at Ayrson Park uh, before playing in Belgium. Uh, when he did leave, I think we got back most of the money. I think we got back over 30000 and most of that money went towards a purchase of another another guy who would become a, a hero, um, Francis Lee. So most of his money that we got from Middlesbrough came. So even in leaving us, he did uh, help uh, sort of cement the future. His City appearances, he was 94 in the league with 24 goals. Not a bad return from an inside forward. FA Cup, he played 14 times with three goals. And the League Cup, he played twice with one goal. And we've got 24 Northern Ireland caps as well. We'll talk about Northern Ireland briefly in a moment. Um, of course, as I said before, there's a little book about as well. So more on this incredible story, this incredible player. Uh, the book by Richie Kelly. Uh, the man they couldn't ban, the John Crossan story. That was from a former BBC sports journalist, uh, Richard Kelly. So seek that out. It is on the internet. It's quite expensive at the moment. I think I've, I saw I saw prices up to about fifteen pound on a certain auction site. But if, uh, that's a great read as well as I said, and also the Guardian newspaper. Have a look at Johnny. Put Johnny Crossan in the search engine on there, and you'll find stuff as well. Yeah, so despite the lows and the jeers of some City fans, uh, many still talk about uh, Johnny Crossan now fondly, and, uh, and this is why I was doing this. As I said, one of my one of my uh, subscribers, one of my friends and viewers, uh, commented that could I do well on Johnny Crossan? I said, yeah, I had plans to do one anyway. Uh, it was just what City needed to get the amount of a tough division. He was, he was talented. He was tough. And he was the sort of guy you want by in your trend in the trenches. You know, I always look at that with people, uh, whoever I employed people in the past or whatever. If it, is it someone I want next to me when the going gets tough? 
and it was no it was no shame that he struggled that last season, say with his injuries and his illness. But obviously, we also had the likes of Colin Bell, Neil Young, and even Tony Coleman uh, were coming through. And um, obviously, as a as a bigger fish, perhaps at other clubs, i.e. Sunderland, no disrespect, and uh, perhaps City's growth and obviously the quality of the talent around him threatened threatened that position. And he was a very proud man. Um, and I think uh, that's probably shown in that last season in temperament wise he, in a derby against United uh, he was dropped uh, for the derby against United in 66-67 and he even put a transfer request in then so obviously again that just shows his dedication and the fact he was, he was very proud and, of what he could do and he wasn't happy being dropped but there's no doubt in his quality and uh, also for Northern Ireland um, There'll be an image on screen there. He also, uh, as he did with City and Sunderland, was a cult, something of a cult hero in Northern Ireland with the Northern Irish fans. He was even revered, revered that much that uh, as much as the legend George Best. Yeah, I mean, he was just, just as popular and just as revered. I mean, there's a picture there, obviously, with George Best being... Uh, shouldered, um, um, carried off shoulder high, and also Johnny Cross, and uh, that was to do a, and he scored one of the greatest volley goals ever seen at uh, at Northern Ireland's ground as well. So he he was revered as much by the Northern Irish fans as the great George Best. So what more, what higher praise and accolade could you ask for a player? But uh, yeah, he wasn't with us long, was he? But. Uh, it was great to look back, and all I can say is thank you for joining me as this little little tribute to. Uh, Johnny Jobby Cross Crossen or whichever nickname you want to call him. But I like Jobby. I think we should have called him Jobby. I think that's a great name, Jobby Cro Jobby Crossen. I think I mean, that's fantastic. But uh, what a player! And uh, obviously, let me know your memories. If you got memories of him, say mine are very, very. Um, very sparse as I say I could look at images but uh, at six and seven years old I'm sorry I don't have a greatest memory but all I can say I was glad that I was there to watch him I was there in the stands watching him and uh, I would have been there at the same time within yards of the guy so that's all I can ever ask and for a guy who's uh, uh, the first City player perhaps to feature on my bedroom wall what more what more could any player ask never mind what more could any fan ask you know that's just one of those things so thanks for joining for this little Player in time feature on Johnny Crossan. What are we going to do with this today? Have a great one. Look after yourselves, look after your friends, look after your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. So you join me again here on the Citizen Channel for another City Pass feature or a City Present feature. It doesn't matter, whatever it is. All I ever ask of you is please stay safe, Blues. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>